Today's a big day. Um, some of you may know this, some of you may not know this, um, but six years ago today, Summit Church had our first service. Isn't that incredible? Six years. So if you don't know the Summit story, we were South Coast, South Gore, and we merged together and became Summit. And so if, you, if you're coming here and you're like, wow, nice new building, but this church really doesn't have it all together, just remember, we're only six and we're sinners. Okay? So we've got two things kind of working against us there, all right? Um, we will always be sinners, but we won't always be six, all right? So anyway, um, that's encouraging. It should be encouraging. Some of you are like, oh, what did he just say? Anyway, um, so yeah, six years old. Can you believe it? I feel like we should sing happy birthday or somebody should leave and go get a cake or something. I mean, I just, I don't know. You got time. <laughs> you got time. Anyway, uh, so happy birthday to Summit. It's hard to believe that it's been six years, and we've seen... We're talking about prayer today, and we've just seen God answer prayer after prayer after prayer and work miracle after miracle after miracle here. If you're here, and you're, again, you're new or recent to Summit, you're sitting, in, you're sitting amongst miracles. You're sitting amongst two churches that probably should have never got along, should have never merged, should have never, you know, <laughs> should have never had me be their pastor. Like, there's so many should never haves, and yet... God worked a miracle. You're sitting in a, in, on a land that, uh, in a building that God worked a miracle uh, to get us here. And there's so many things along the way um, that brought us to this place. And so thankful and, uh, and just excited today to celebrate that with you. All right, Colossians chapter 4. We've been walking verse by verse through the book of Colossians for quite some time now. And uh, we've got three more messages today and then two more weeks in the book of Colossians. And I'm excited as we kind of come to a close to see how Paul is wrapping up this letter to the church at Colossae. Now, it's important to remember, dating back to like October when we began this letter to the church at Colossae from Paul, Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, right, that Paul starts out and most of the first chapter and a half is Paul's prayer, pleading with God to the people. And now as he's wrapping it up and he's talked about old self versus new self, and last week he kind of gave some relational instructions um, on wives and husbands, you know, parents and children, um, believers and leaders, all, all those different things. Um, and, and, then to, and then as he's bringing this letter to a close, he's kind of given some final instructions. And so let's pick it up. Chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. That's what this is all we're going to cover this morning. It says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, that I may make it clear which is how I have to speak. Pray with me one more time. God, I pray today that you would use me to make this clear. God, make your, make your text, make your scripture clear to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Now I want you to think for just a moment, what's prayer? Right? What's prayer? Now, many of us would probably respond to that question, well, prayer's talking to God. Right? Prayer's talking to God. It's conversation with God. It's, it's, it's asking God to basically meet all my needs or, 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 or hear all my concerns or all of those things. And if, and if you're sitting there thinking, yeah, prayer is talking to God, you're half right. Okay? Half right. Notice the perspective there. You're not half wrong. We're a glass half empty kind of perspective. Okay, that's, it's good. Right, you're half right. Okay, talking to God. Um, prayer is more than a one-way conversation. Right? And so Paul, when Paul says continue steadfastly in prayer, my favorite definition of prayer is this. I, I, I picked this up like 10 years ago, and it's always stuck with me. Prayer is constant communion with God. Not communication, but constant communion with God. 
And so prayer is more than just talking to God. Prayer is more than just giving him my laundry list of of things where he needs to show up or or me saying, God, have you not seen what's happening here, right? Have you not seen what's going on here? Have you not seen the situations, the circumstances that you're putting me in here and yet you're still asking me to have joy, right? Have you not seen, have you not seen and sometimes it feels like prayer, our prayers aren't hitting the ceiling and all those different things. But prayer is constant communion with God. The way that I love to describe this is do you have that relationship with that person where you can spend hours with that person, not say a thing, but yet feel immediate, like amazingly fulfilled? Right? Like you don't, like, like with my kid, they don't have to say a word and we can spend eight hours together and it's just incredible. Right? Or Kristen and I can have a whole conversation without saying a word to each other, right? Parents, especially with kids, that's really important, right? Because if you're trying, you have to talk in code, communicate in code, so you've got your own like sign language, you've got your own, you've got your own way of communicating so that you can decide where mom and dad want to go to dinner without the kids weighing in at all, <laughs> right? Which is really important. It's extremely important to get there, okay? It's extremely important to get there, Right? So is communion with God, right? Um, My favorite quote on prayer is this. I never pray for more than five minutes, but I never go five minutes without praying, right? And that that kind of stirs that whole communion with God, that we want to be in communion with God in such a way where we're, we're, we're communicating with him. We're communing with him throughout the day. Right? About everything. And here's, and here's where I feel like prayer breaks down for us today. Can, I, can, just, can we just start here and then we'll look at how Paul tells us to pray? How many of you love accessories? Come on now. Accessories. Okay, I see those hands, right? I don't, I don't have many accessories. Okay? I like the idea of accessories. But it just takes a lot of time to accessorize, doesn't it? Now, I'm, and, and there's different levels of accessories, right? I mean, you can, you, you have, you have like, like, like clothing accessories, like earrings, necklaces, rings, what am I forget, bracelets, anklets, toe rings, <laughs> hair stuff, head stuff, yeah, I mean, hats, all, all kinds of different things. I mean, shoelaces today are an accessory, right? I mean, because you can swap out shoelaces, can't you? Yeah? I mean, Brent shook his head immediately, so we know that he's not an accessorizing guy, right? But then, but then like, like let's, take it, let's take it further than that. Like, we can have, we can have like, like, room accessories, right? Like, accessorize your room, like a, you know, you know, a painting or a lamp or, or something like that. A couple of guys are like, I'm out. You know, <laughs> they're heading for the exits. Okay, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing accessories this morning, Right? I was gonna come. I was gonna come today, all all dolled up in accessories and all of that. But I just I couldn't be, couldn't be weighed down. Um, I, you know, it just it's just too much, right? Um, but for those of you that accessorize, you'll 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 be able to identify with this completely. I feel like one of the biggest problems in our prayer lives today as Christians is this: we treat God as an accessory instead of Lord of all. When it comes to our prayer lives, when it comes to needing Jesus in our life, when it comes to needing God in our life, we love to access him when it's convenient. We love to ask him when we're desperate. But when it comes to, you know, not praying for more than five minutes, but not going without five, going, not going with five minutes without praying, right? That's kind of a foreign concept to us, to many of us. Because we're, we're consumed with our lives. We're consumed with our stuff. We're consumed with all of the other accessories and all of the other things that we've got to fulfill. And if, things, if something's got to come off the plate, more than likely it's going to be our commitment, our devotion, our lordship, his lordship to us first. It's convenient. Now, I'm not trying to slap anybody's hand here. Please hear me. But we see that in the statistics of church attendance, right? We see that in the statistics of church attendance. Um, uh, Christians say today that, um, that uh, uh, what's the term? Uh, um, committed church attendance, 
right? Regular attendance in church is 50%, right? 50%. That if we show up two Sundays out of the month, if we give God two Sundays, now typically those are Sundays where we're already awake, right? Those are Sundays, I mean, you're here today, right? Because it's Pro Bowl day. Next Sunday is Super Bowl day. Right? And so some of you are going to be getting your brisket ready and all of that, and you better invite me over. If you're not, I'll be offended. You know, all those different things. Right? Right? I mean, be, and so today's a convenient day, right? And, 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 yet, and yet if God, if, if, if God doesn't fit in our convenient schedules, then chances are it's not going to happen. We treat him as an accessory. We treat him as an accessory. Right? Or as long as... As long, here, here's, here's a tough one, as long as God is meeting my needs, as long as I feel good, as long as it feels like he's answering in the ways that I think he should, I'm in. I'm in. But the second, the second, things get questionable. The second something bad happens, the second, right, all, all, of, all of these things that enter our mind, all these questions that are age-old questions, why do bad things happen to good people, why, are, why is Patrick Mahomes in another Super Bowl, like why, like, <laughs> we just lose heart, which Patriot fans, we've got to remember that this is how the rest of the country has felt for the last 20 years, okay, right? And so what I want you to see here from Paul is that Paul is spending the second half of his letter pleading, pleading with the church at Colossae to not treat or see God as an accessory, but to see him as Lord, constant communion with God, continue steadfastly, continue earnestly in communion with him, in constant communion with him, in prayer, in prayer. Let's talk more about that. So again, Paul is drawing his letter to a close. He's led the Colossian church on a breathtaking journey covering everything from Jesus' eternal identity, from global mission, down to the need for kindness in all of our relationships. And after he is focused so consistently on the lordship of Jesus and our union with Jesus, it's no accident that he ends with this focus on prayer. He opened the letter by revealing what he prayed for. And now he's closing the letter, encouraging them to pray, but also asking them to pray all the more for him. And we must take on trust the fact that it is him, God, speaking to us through the Bible, right? But we can speak directly in prayer to him, trusting that he hears both our words and our groans. That's one of the most amazing th attributes about God to me, is that we can be in a room like this of, I don't know, pastor numbers, 1,500, 2,000 people <laughs> this morning, right? We can all be praying at the same time, and God hears every single one of us. Isn't that amazing? Like, that is just unbelievable to think about God, if two of my kids are talking at the same time, I'm ready to just jump, right? But yet God can hear all of his children all over the world in all of the different languages and be able to make it out and hear them all at the same time. Isn't that incredible? He's such an individual God. We enjoy an extraordinary privilege as children of God and being able to talk to him and being able to commune with him daily, moment by moment. But prayer is not always easy, is it? And so Paul is talking here about struggling in prayer, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And so Paul urges the Colossians to Continue yourselves, devote yourselves to prayer. It's a straightforward enough statement, isn't it? But if your prayer life is anything like mine, it is honored more in the breach than in the, than, than the observance. Let's talk about why that is. That's because prayer is hard work. Communion or communication is hard work, isn't it? 
I mean, you think about it. Uh, when is the last time that you've been in tension with someone because of a lack of communication or miscommunication? Some of you are like 20 minutes ago when we came to church, right? A lack of communication or miscommunication, right? And so, and so he's saying uh, that's because prayer is hard work. This should already be obvious, right, in the life of Paul when he's writing about how he's strenuous. He, he, he contends with all of the energy that he has in chapter 1 as he's praying for the church at Colossae that this is the language of sweat and toil. That prayer is sweat and toil. I, I, I love what someone uh, told me years ago. They said, I, I want to pray until my knees go raw. Sign me up. Right? We, and the reality is, when it comes to our priorities, we will always give time to what we think is important, won't we? We will always give time to what we deem is important. If we want to get into a football team, then we'll make sacrifices to go to team practice, to read about the team, to, to watch games. If we want to become an illusionist, a magician, we'll spend hours practicing a, a slate of hand to hide coins, playing cards, rabbits up our shirt cuffs, all these different things. If we want to spend time with God, then we must decide to do so. We've got to decide that this is important enough for me to do. None of these things will come effortlessly, and they'll all entail foregoing other things that we might enjoy. But notice, yet again, Paul is not laying down the law here. He's not offering a list of rules and regulations by which we measure our efforts for prayerfulness can only be motivated by response to God's grace. Prayerfulness can only be motivated by a response to God's grace. Grace. That's why we spend, that's why we want to spend time with him. That's why Paul uses a word like devote yourself or continue steadfastly because it suggests our sincere passion as much as it does our deliberate purpose. See, sometimes there's a battle between our passion and our purpose, isn't there? Right? Sometimes there's a battle between our passion and our purpose when we get distracted by other things that might be good in and of themselves to do, but that drag us away from things that we want to prioritize, like prayer time. This is probably why many take a cue from Jesus himself, who rose early in the morning to pray, when others were not around to disturb or distract him. But for some, evenings are best, right? While others manage to use their daily commute to and from work or what have you to spend time to prioritize with God. One thing I like to say when it comes to our prayer life or spending time with God or devoting yourself to God is this, right? Some people, some people like I said, they, they, they swear by the mornings, some people are like, no, I'm a before bed kind of person. Some people are like, I'm a lunchtime person. Well, here's, here's what I say. There's no wrong way to eat a Reese's. <laughs> right? There's no wrong way to eat a Reese's. If you're spending time with Jesus, that's the point. That's the goal. Right? That's the goal. That's the goal. However you get there, that's fine. If the goal is to tackle that Reese's, some of you eat the edges first, save the middle. Some of you take the time to cut out the middle first because you like the edges and save those for last, weirdos. Um, <laughs> right? Some of you are like, I can't even think about it that much. When I see a Reese's, I just get lost in the Reese's, and so I just shove the whole thing in my mouth. Anybody like me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I see those hands, right? Hey, too much thought going into it. I just got to, it's like Nike, just do it, right? I <laughs> just pop it in. I don't want a Reese's now. Anybody? <laughs> My God. And I'm not really a Reese's guy, but anyway. Okay, guess not. All right. Uh, right? There's no wrong way to eat a Reese's. What's that? Yeah. No, we don't do sponsorships. That'd be cool. Somebody should contact. Anyway, all right. Okay, where are we at? Okay, there we are, right? What matters here? is that each and every one of us find a way to spend time in prayer. Find a way to devote 
time to God in prayer. Find a way using whatever methods that help. There are no rules, but we can develop good disciplines, right? So for, for, for me, right, I know that if I'm going to be disciplined before God, I've got to do it before a certain time. Right? I've got to do it before a certain time. If I'm going to be disciplined in, in my life to, to accomplish some of the priorities that I need to accomplish, I've got to do them early. I've got to do them early. Right? For others, that's not possible. We're all different. For one, spent years feeling guilty for struggling to persist in prayer while sitting down in one place as if this was the only way to be faithful as a Christian. And I know what some of you are thinking, Pastor Travis, you, you don't struggle like I struggle. You can't struggle like I struggle. You're like a professional Christian. <laughs> this is like your job. Oh man, if you could only spend a week with me. It was quite the discovery to hear from a friend who says that he has his quiet time when he's out with the dog. That's his quiet time, going for a walk with the dog, right? And I can testify to finding that my best times of prayer have happened while doing similar things, and, and it, but it matters little what tools you use or what styles you like. All that matters is that we devote ourselves to prayer. That's what Paul's talking about. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Why? Because it shows, it gives God his proper place in your life. If we're devoting ourselves to prayer, if we're, continue steadfast, if we're continuing steadfastly in prayer, then God is not an accessory. He's Lord of all. If we're praying the way that we're called to pray, when we pray, we surrender our wills to God's will, and we're making him Lord of our life. And so Paul tells us a couple things here to help us in prayer. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And so he says, continue steadfastly. And in our word there, our point there is going to be to be faithful. Continue in prayer. Look at your, look at your neighbor and say, keep doing it. Okay, this side's still awake. This side, I'll give you another chance in a minute, okay? What this means is to be consistent in your prayer life. Be devoted. Don't quit. Too many of us only pray occasionally when we feel like it or when there's a crisis, right? Pray without ceasing is God's command to us. And so we should be constantly in fellowship with God so that prayer is as normal to us as breathing. That prayer is as normal to us as breathing. That it's natural to us. That it just becomes, it's that discipline that just becomes so natural to us. The second thing Paul says is being watchful in it. Being watchful in prayer. What does Paul have in mind when he urges his readers to be watchful? Well, there's some notable precedents from, from his word. Jesus called on his disciples in Matthew chapter 25 to keep watch for his return because we do not know his timing. Prayerfully waiting and crying out, come Lord, in 1 Corinthians 16 would certainly fit with what Paul wrote earlier in Colossians. Jesus also told his disciples in Gethsemane to watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. Matthew chapter 26. This would be wise advice in light of the Paul's diagnosis of the human heart, right? That we should certainly incorporate both senses of being watchful into our prayer lives, being watchful for God coming, but also being watchful for temptation, right? Because when we pray, our minds are on the things above and not on our own needs, Right? And, so, and so it's simply a matter of being watchful for answers to the prayers that we pray. But here's my question. What are you praying for? And don't, that's a rhetorical question. Don't, don't shout it out. But I want you to think about, what is the thing that you are asking God desperately for today? What is the thing that you're asking God desperately for today? And I'm, I'm, 
I'm concerned that we may not have a response to that. What is the thing that you're asking God desperate for today? Where, where, where there's an army in the Old Testament, right? They're in battle. And the only way that they can win is if it stays dark. Or no, if it stays light. Excuse me, scratch that. If it stays light. And so the, 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 the leader in the battle prays that God would make the sun stand still. That the sun would stop and stay light. Because if it goes dark and the, and, the, and, the, and, and the enemy escapes, right, then they'll be able to go back, they'll be able to retool, they'll be able to re-strategize, they'll be able to come back and more than likely win the battle. And so the leader of the army prays, God, you've got to make the sun stand still. If you don't make the sun stand still, we're dead. Literally. Dead. Cries out to God, make the sun stand still. What'd God do? Made the sun stand still. They won the battle. Right? Prayed for rain in a drought. It rained. Prayed for the sea to divide so that they could have a place to go, the Israelites, when the Egyptians were chasing them. And it says they, they crossed on dry land. Right? All throughout Scripture, we see God answer desperate prayers. And you know what I was thinking about as I was preparing for this? Maybe we're not desperate enough. Maybe we're not desperate enough. Maybe we're not desperate enough. Who's that person in your life that you just are begging that God would meet Jesus? Pray for him. When's the last time you prayed for him? See, I believe we're falling under the false uh, the, this, this false premise, right, that we can change hearts, that if we're good enough, if we show enough, if we communicate enough, or if we could just, if we could just get them to the right sermon, if Pastor Travis would just preach the right sermon for the love, right, and they were there on the perfect day, right, then, 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 then I just know they would meet Jesus, or I just know that they would change their heart, or I just know that they would soften to the things of God. But do you know something? It has nothing to do with any of that. God is the only one that can change hearts. And so if you're sitting here today, and you've got that friend, you've got that coworker, you've got that family member, you're just begging, ah, oh, I just wish that they would meet Jesus. Pray. Pray. Pray, pray, God, they need you. Tear down walls, put the people in their life that may be me, may not be me, that would point them to you, that would point them to your son Jesus, that would point them to new life, that would point them to eternity. I'm convinced that each and every one of us, if we believe in Jesus, should have at least one other person that we're praying, that we're begging God for their salvation. Because don't you want to see them in eternity? Don't you want to spend forever worshiping God for them? Family, we've got to pray for salvation. We've got to pray for salvation, being watchful in it, and pray for opportunities. Paul, Paul, Paul finishes this section. We're going to talk about this more next week as well, but he finishes this section, and at, at the same time, pray also for us, right? That God may open up a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Jesus on account of which I'm in prison. Paul's in prison for sharing the gospel of Jesus, which is, which is a big word for the good news of Jesus, that I may make it clear, which is how I have to speak. And so Paul is saying, Paul is saying, listen, we're joining you in this because we're praying for you, but you also need to pray for us that we make it clear, right? I ask you every Sunday morning, pray that. Pray that. Pray that for, for me or whoever's filling this pulpit and every other church that you know about. Pray that. 
Pray that on your way to church on Sunday morning. Pray that when you wake up, that God, use Travis today, that he would make it clear what he's supposed to say and have him leave out all the football jokes. <laughs> right? Pray that he would make it clear the gospel that, he's, that he is supposed to preach today, that he would make it clear, right? Pray that. And so, and so, and so this, isn't, this, isn't just a, this isn't just a, hey, this is how we should pray. This is also how we should pray for each other, right? That, that, that God would use you being watchful in your prayer life, being watchful that if he gives you an opportunity to speak, an opportunity to testify about his goodness, an opportunity to celebrate who he is, an opportunity to, to struggle with somebody like, yes, I know, I've struggled with that too, that you would seize the moment and not let it pass by. That you would take the opportunity to share about the good news of Jesus, not say, oh, they probably didn't want to hear it. Oh, they probably didn't, right? The third thing he says, he says to be faithful, continue steadfastly, right? Keep doing it. He says to be watchful, looking for opportunities, but also recognizing that when we pray, we're fighting temptation. But thirdly, he says being thankful. Now, in Philippians, Paul says this a couple of times, right? Giving thanks, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. And so Paul, Paul is, is all about making sure that people are, are giving thanks to God for the, for the things that, that he's doing in their lives, right? Being thankful, being joyful, you know? And, and I, was, I was thinking about this, right? That there ought to be joy in our salvation, right? That when we come into this place, we should be filled with the joy of what God's doing. That doesn't mean that we always have to be happy and content with, with, with the struggles and the things that we're going through, but it means that, man, we can, we can have a place where we can come and sit in, in the peace of God and smile. Like, let me, let me just say something to you this morning. Is that okay? That, that was an unfair question. Because obviously, I'm going to. <laughs> if you can't smile in church, where can you smile? Some of you are really forcing it right now. <laughs> Some of you are really forcing it. The jo- I mean, Scripture says the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. And so if we, if we struggle to come in here, to come in this place for this hour to five hours a day, right, on a Sunday, if we struggle to come into this place and sit in joy, how can we expect it anywhere else? And we're going to talk about next week how he says, be, be salt and light, how we're supposed to make this thing, you know, uh, uh, appealing to other people. Some of y'all got work to do. Love you. We got work to do. We got work to do. I mean, I mean, when's the last time you talked about your prayer life in such a way where someone else was like, man, I got to pray. I got to pray. I got to pray. I believe that is... I say this all the time, I feel like, but I believe that is the best evangelism tool that you have is God's answered prayers in your life, the way that he's shown up in your life. And as you're at the water cooler at work talking about, man, I was just, I was just, this, this just happened. I was just praying for this and this happened. God showed up in my life. That stirs in people. That stirs in people. It stirs in people. So being thankful. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. It's almost as if Paul can't give an instruction without slipping in thankfulness as an afterthought. We see it all throughout his writing. 
except it's no such thing. Grace and gratitude clearly have the same roots in English, and so do the words they translate in Paul's original Greek. But that should be no surprise, because how can a recipient of divine grace not be profoundly thankful? Not be profoundly thankful. And then lastly, he says, be purposeful. If you look at verse 3 there, he says, at the same time, pray also for us. And notice the specific prayer here that God may open to us a door for the word. To declare the mystery of Jesus, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Pray specifically for God to move. Now, Isaiah 56, 7 says this, these, are, these I will bring to my holy mountain. I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Get this, Jeremiah 7, verse 11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a demon of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Matthew 21, 13. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Of prayer, Mark eleven seventeen, and he was teaching them and saying to them, "Is it is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations?" And so, all throughout Scripture, and we see it on and on and on and on, all throughout Scripture, that we are called to be relentless in prayer, deliberate and constant in prayer. Don't ever stop examining. Psalm 39, search me, O God, know my heart, know my prayer, right? And here's the deal. I'm learning. I haven't perfected this, okay? I haven't perfected this by any means. But if you're taking notes, write this down, because I believe this is really important, okay? I'm learning that the secret to prayer is secret prayer. I heard that from a friend of mine a little more than a year ago, that I'm learning, and I'm, and I'm seeing it myself, that in solitude, in rest, in secret, is, is, is where we hear and we feel and we make sense of God the most. Pray like it's your job. Depend on God like it's all you've got. Depend on God like it's all you've got. Matthew 5, 6. Jesus is starting a Sermon on the Mount. Longest recorded sermon of Jesus that we have. And he starts with these things called Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 6 is one of the Beatitudes. And Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When is the last time that you hungered and thirsted for the things of God? Hungered and thirsted for the things of God. Like you thirst for that cup of coffee before you can quote unquote function in the morning. Like you hunger for something sweet at around 8 o'clock at night. Anybody else? <laughs> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I want to end with something this morning. Kind of a recognition. This is from a guy by the name of Alistair Begg, great preacher, author. He wrote this, almost all of us find prayer hard at some point. Have you ever found prayer hard? Why is that? One of the reasons why we're tempted to give up on prayer, which Paul says continue steadfastly in prayer, one of the reasons that we're tempted to give up on prayer is that we don't always receive an immediate response from God. In a world that so highly exalts instant gratification, this is a real difficulty. 
It's the same issue as trying to maintain a proper exercise regimen or diet. We want to see results now. We want to see results today. If our new approach does not quickly show its benefits, most of us are likely to not persevere. Our tendency to lack of endurance is one reason that Jesus told the parable about the persistent widow in Luke 18 who was relentless in seeking out justice from the judge. Luke makes the editorial comment that Jesus was encouraging his listeners to understand that they ought to always pray and not to lose heart. In other words, Jesus wants us to pray and then keep on praying. Did you get that? Jesus wants us to pray and then keep on praying. When Paul tells us to keep alert and to pray with all perseverance, he's echoing Jesus' words to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he died. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation, Matthew 26. Paul spoke similarly to the church at Ephesus and their leaders, telling them to be alert, Acts 20. In a world embodied, embroiled in a cosmic spiritual battle, the stakes are too high to give up on prayer. As we keep coming to God with prayer and with supplication, we will all have to learn to be content with trusting God, with trusting that God will answer us in his good timing, not ours. And we will all need to remember that the enemy would love nothing more than to persuade us that prayer makes no difference and that God doesn't listen, much less act. You may not see an answer to a desperate prayer on this side of eternity. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to mislead you. Go home, pray boldly, make your knees raw, and the Lord will answer you. But you may not see a response. You may not hear an answer. You may not see a difference this side of eternity. Sometimes persistence may appear to be met with silence. But... In due time, God will show you that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. As Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he answers all your prayers exactly when he knows it is right to and in precisely the manner that is always best for you. God is always doing far more than we could ever ask or imagine. Sometimes we can get a glimpse of some of his purposes, but sometimes we're asked to live by faith, not by sight. Are there people or situations that you've given up praying for because you've had no clear or positive response? Remember that you've not had such a response yet. One day, you will see what God was doing and directing matters differently than how you would have chosen. Remember, you're not God. And until that day, you can persevere in prayer because that is what he commands and because he's promised to work for the good of his people. And so why not today begin to pray with perseverance for something you've quit speaking to God about? What do you need to today start praying for that you've stopped asking God for? What's something today that you need to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving that you've just given up on? That you've just given up on? And I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you, write that down. Take it home. Before you leave this morning, share it with somebody. Will you join with me in this prayer? And your response is yes, if you'll join me in this prayer. Yes, if you'll join me in this prayer. There's power in numbers. There's power in numbers. There's power in numbers.
I'll never forget being discouraged. Worship team, come on. I'll never forget being discouraged. Because when God called me to ministry when I was 16, I felt like God called me to a specific thing. And, and you know, you see the confidence, you see the faith of a 16-year-old, right? And so when that 16-year-old ran to some other people and said, I believe this is what God's called me to do. You know what some people did? They laughed at me. They laughed at me. They laughed at me, right? Only two people said, aw, thanks for caring, (laughs) right? You know my concern? People aren't laughing at our prayers enough anymore. People aren't laughing at our prayers enough. That we'd be so bold, God, make the sun stand still. That we'd be so bold, God, provide a way for us to do this. As we said earlier, I I don't think it's a coincidence at all that we're preaching or we're speaking about expecting big things from God today on our six-year anniversary. Because, because I'll, I'll be honest, I laughed the first two times I heard about a church merger and said, I don't want to pastor a church merger. I don't want to pastor that church at all. No interest. It's the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Not much better. No, I'm just kidding. What have you quit praying for that you need to pick up praying for today? What do you need to pray for that you are almost scared to pray for because it's so ridiculous? Certainly you don't want to tell other people. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you say, man, Travis, how do I start? How do I start? You get alone. And you say, dear God. And you see what comes out. You just start. You just start. You just start. So God, today, as we pray here, I pray for a hunger and thirst for time with you among your people today. Convict us of making you an accessory. Maybe today we seek to make you Lord of all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.